I am so grateful to have my wonderful friend and colleague John Strilecki in the podcast today again. Thank you so much for being here and um, I'm very I'm looking very much forward to to our conversation. Thank you. It's a joy to be back. It's great to see you and uh, I, I love our conversations so I, I can't wait to spend time today. Me too. For everyone uh, not watching, but only listening. So I see you right now sitting uh, im Café am Rande der Welt, <laughs> um, which looks beautiful. And can you tell me a little bit, because I think the last time we talked, you told me that your dream or vision is also to have the cafe one day sort of in reality. So did something like that happen? <laughs> or... <laughs> well, it, it's, a, it's a work in progress. So through the power of technology, I was able to describe it to someone who is a designer and then to create something I do calls and interview the rest of that, that I can be in the cafe. And I'm on a little bit of a bender recently. And by that, I mean, like I have this passion for helping people experience the cafe in other aspects of their lives, because I get these amazing emails from our podcast together, our interviews that we do, people who read the books and they, they talk about what the experience in the cafe means to them. And I know this on a heart level for myself. I was just going through the process of editing something and I came across a line in the third you know, the second cafe book and the character Jessica is talking about how lost she feels. And Casey is interacting with her and she's talking about the cafe and she says, this is the place people come to be found. This is the place lost people come to be found is the line. And when I read that line, I get chills. I still get chills up and down my spine because that is what the cafe means to me. It is this place where we can go to find the answers that we've been seeking. And I know I find them every time I go back and I read stuff, especially Casey. Casey is just like this like incredible piece of wisdom comes from her all the time. It's beautiful. Is there a question or is has there been a moment in the last year since we've talked the last time um, where you felt lost or where you had a question and not yet the answer? I would say the entire third cafe book is entirely based on me being lost. Mm. Uh, so I turned 50, turned 51 this year. And the experience of going from 48 to 50 and then 51 was a very challenging time for me. Mm. And so, you know, I just, I think that as we go through life and we go through different phases, the questions that we thought we had the answers to may feel a little bit different and, and maybe we go back to those same questions again and uh, so for me i had struggled for probably two to three years with this issue of getting older and what it meant to me and why i was feeling this pain and honestly laura it was only in going back to the cafe and writing that book that i found the answers that i couldn't seem to find anywhere else and so for me the cafe on a very personal level is a very magical place That's beautiful. I, there are two things I, I would like to, to talk about. So the one thing is, what is it for you exactly when you say to go back to the cafe? So where do you go? <laughs> is it a mental place? Is it also for you an actual place? You like what feels for you like the cafe? Where, where do you go? Yeah, it's uh, it's more of a mental activity than anything else, but mm -hmm. it's And I can, I can say that normally when I'm in the process of writing, so when I wrote the third cafe book, it was actually sitting down and writing the dialogue. But when I do that, I am physically there. I am in that space. I am seeing everything around me, just like you're seeing it on our screen today, but I see it. I can, I can experience it on a deep, deep level that I'm really there so much so that the rest of the world sort of dissolves behind me. I, I, I lose myself in that experience and have to sort of zone pop back out to wherever I physically am. And so I love that about the cafe and knowing that it enables me to enter that space, not just when I'm writing, but anytime that I want. And I think that's available to every single person. And uh, that's something for, that's great to remember, right? To be able to tap into whatever that energy is. That's beautiful. I, I have the same, um, like I do this with Maui. So I have like this place for me in Maui. There's like this certain place in the nature where I am like 
there's and I can tap in that just in my mental space. So I think it's it's I, I really feel what you what you're saying and I think this is already one thing that everyone can take with them that you can create a place inside of you where you can go to and where you feel safe and where you can get answers and where you are kind of like for me, I, I would like to know how it is with you. For me, the Maui place. So I feel like I'm connecting, I'm connected to something. So I get different answers than I would give myself in the normal situation, sort of. Um, is this the same for you as well when you tap into the cafe in your mental, um, I call it, let's call it like a healing place, sort of. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have the feeling that you can get better, deeper, more honest answers when, when you are there? Uh, yeah, so I, I love that question and I love the way that we're going because to me, this is one of the biggest insights I've had over the last six months. Uh, it's something that I was, I think, very close to trying to figure out previously to this. It was like sort of tapping me on the shoulder and I couldn't quite get the essence of it. Here's what I've discovered over the last six months, that there is a cosmic algorithm of the universe that is constantly underlying everything that we see, that we experience. And in the same way that there are algorithmic rules that come up when we type something in on Google and it realizes that's what I'm interested in, right? That if you expound that to the universe and realize that there's this cosmic algorithm of the universe that is at play, it opens up an opportunity to do things in life that really nobody had ever taught me. Nobody ever even began to teach me. And one of them is this exact concept that you're talking about. I believe that when you tap into Maui, when I tap into the cafe, we are not actually connecting to our memories. What we are doing is we are directly connecting to the energy associated with that entity. And so for you in Maui, it's not just the physical location. It's the energy of everybody who's been at that location. It's the essence of the teachings that were done there. There is a reason that you picked that exact spot because Maui is a relatively large island. The Hawaiian chain is relatively large. The world is very large. But for some reason, Laura Molina Seiler picked that exact spot in Maui. And whether that is because your energy has been there in previous physical forms of life or because somehow your future is tied to that or your fairy godmother lives there. I don't know, right? Uh, but for you, it's this spot in Maui. And for me, it's the cafe. And when I tap into that space, I am tapping into the cosmic algorithm of the universe that says that is a place where I can go to find answers. Mm -hmm. I think one of the greatest opportunities for us as individuals is to find where is our place and to allow ourselves to tap into that energy. Because what else I've discovered in the last six months is that entry and exit to that destination become easier with practice. And the ability to decode the information that we're receiving from it becomes better with practice. It's almost like gaining fluency. And so the first time you travel to a country where you don't speak the language, maybe you understand less than 1% of 1% of what's being said. But six months in, you can become fluent in the language. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that's the case here too. Do you feel, have you had that experience when you are going back and forth? Is the channel getting wider? Is your understanding getting better? Definitely, definitely. So it's, it's quicker, same. it's quicker. Yeah. It's it's also the, what, what I've been thinking, what it, what it is for me, maybe it's the same for you, is I relax. Yeah. I go there and I relax. And I think this is very often the, the biggest problem I have when I'm stressed, when I'm, um, yeah, when I'm, when I'm just <laughs> like energetically confused, let's say, <laughs> because I'm not within myself with my energy, right. uh, then I cannot tap into the information that is the best for me, but I'm in the energy of fear or of, of controlling things. And then I get that like algorithm, let's say, giving me information. And I think this is so beautiful when I think about it, that I think one of the magic things about those places is you go there and I also connect to this relaxed feeling I have mm -hmm. there, this total relaxation, knowing everything is well, everything is okay. Just relax into the answer and it will come. How, how is that with you? Is it similar in the cafe? So when I go back to the cafe, I feel a sense of coming home. Yeah. 
Like I, I actually just even saying those words to you, I feel a sense of coming home. I feel my eyes tear up and I feel like this connection, like I cannot describe accurately. It's, it's exactly where I'm supposed to be. It's and beautiful. so I think one of the reasons for that is because when we discover this thing, not only are we tapping into the cosmic algorithm of the universe in terms of the information that resides in that location, but the way I visualize it is that that is actually the connection point to the entire universe, mm -hmm. but that is the place where I get my answers. And so I can probably, not I just personally, but we can, we can tap into the information and the energies from anywhere in the universe. But if we go to that place and that's where we do the work, it's almost like amplified a thousand times and our ability to understand it is significantly better because we understand the way it's talking to us if we go there. It's beautiful. How, like for everyone listening right now and just going like, John, Laura, what are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> Um, what would you say are the first steps to create for yourself a place like this? I would say that it is just realizing where you have these moments of peace and connection. And like I said, the cafe is, is it for me. And in interacting with fans, I've found that the cafe is also it for other people. So maybe... Maybe the reason that I had this stream of conscious typing experience that lasted 21 days uh, when the cat first flowed through me is because I was being asked to fulfill a part of my role in the human experience, which is to open up a portal, mm -hmm. to open up a destination. And it was going to take the form of this cool little cafe. And I would get to be the curator of the cafe during my time here on the planet. And it's so much bigger than me. And I get to be the curator for it and I get to invite people to it and we all get to collaborate and share our wisdom. And this becomes a place where people can go. And that is, so I'm not saying that the cafe is it for everyone, like you were describing Maui for you, but it's one of the possible places to go. And my guess is that if we had the chance to hang out and spend some time in this location in Maui, not just me, but like if you took a bunch of people there, you wouldn't be, don't be surprised if that location is also another portal for not just you, but for other people as well. And so I think allowing ourselves, answer your question, to allow ourselves to say, well, where do I feel that connection? Is it a story? Is it a movie? Is it a setting that I saw in a movie or read about in a book? You know, maybe it's, um, I don't know, Tuscany in Italy. You, you read a book about that and you just feel like, whoa. I don't know why, but I feel home when I'm there. And when you are feeling that stress and you lay down at night and you picture Tuscany, it just makes you feel good and you get your answers there. Awesome. So allowing yourself to ask the question, where do I feel that connection? Even if it's just on a micro intuitive sense, like you can't even put more to it than that, then that's a great place to start because maybe that's where your fluency is going to begin. It's so beautiful. I love this picture of the portal you created. I love this. And the um, a question that popped up in my mind for everyone looking for this place is to ask yourself, where does my soul feel at home? Mm -hmm. Like where, where, where is my soul? Like, oh, like here I can relax <laughs> sort of. So maybe that could be also a hint to, to find that place for, for yourself. It's beautiful. I love this. And so, if, I could, if I could throw a little bit of um, patting on the back, you had the in your life to say, I was born in one place on the planet and I feel called to go to this other place. And you did it. I think for so much of my life, I knew that I was born and raised in a certain part of the world. And I viewed my identity associated with that. And one of the big ahas that I've had in life is you don't choose where you're born, but you do choose where you stay yeah. and you don't choose who you're born to, but you do choose who you stay around and to allow ourselves to say, just because I was born here in this environment to these people doesn't mean that that needs to be my future. It can be if you love that and that really makes you feel connected and fulfilled and happy. Awesome. But if it doesn't, allow yourself to see your presence on the planet as a human being, 
or even as an entity that is part of something so much bigger and you are welcome anywhere you want to go. It's amazing. I love this. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, I'm a little bit, I, there are two ways I want to go. So I, the first way I will go is, um, to back to the first question I asked you, because I, I want to wrap that up because I think you said something which is really interesting also for many people listening, because I have a lot of listeners who are younger than me, but I also have listeners who are your age. And, um, I think that in our, um, society, there's somehow this, context about age that it is something um you, you don't want to go sort of yeah that it, it should be always the aim to be young and even younger uh, for women maybe even more than for men right. and um i think this is like absolutely not true because i think that um age well i'm looking forward to get old because i just i'm, I'm looking <laughs> forward to be myself when i'm old because then i know so many things and it will be so much easier <laughs> so <laughs> I am actually looking forward to it. And um, you you said that for you, between uh, being 48 and then the three years until turning for, uh, 51 this year, um, that it has been for you also a, a challenge to 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 get older. And um, so just to to wrap that up, how how what is your your um, position now to to towards age? So what was really fascinating in going through this experience that I mentioned a little bit earlier, writing the cafe, so I couldn't find my answers. I was really struggling with this and it was very much of an internal struggle. So the way in which I interacted with my daughter was still the same, um, but it was very much of an internal struggle for me. And the answers that I found in going back and writing the third cafe book were the following. It doesn't matter that I'm frustrated with getting older. It doesn't matter that I'm frustrated with the fact that I have to wear reading glasses instead of just being able to look at my phone or look at the dialogue, I'm still going to get older. <laughs> and so there's this character in the third cafe book called Max and Max is in his late seventies and he's got this like unabashed, I'm going to call it like it is perspective on life. And he basically says to, to me, the character of John, he says, tell me something you enjoy. And I said, I, I like going to the movies. And he says, all right, how many times do you go to the movies? And you do the quick math and he's like, all right, you got about 300 movies left that you're going to see at the movie theater. And he's like, tell me something else you like. Uh, Christmas, all right? You got about 28 Christmases left. And it was in the process of writing that that I realized, yeah, like you could, I could sit and be frustrated with the fact that these things are changing and I can't do some of the things I want to be able to do in the same way. But every minute I spend on that frustration is a minute that I'm missing living life right now. And if I miss that, then I'm going to get to be 72 or 71 and lamenting the fact that I wasn't doing the things that I wanted to be doing when I was 51. So it was just a tremendous takeaway that no, it's maybe not as perfect as you wish it were, but you know what? Step up, put your big boy pants on and start really enjoying the moment that you have now, or you're going to be wishing you had enjoyed that moment sometime in the future. So I really, I owe it all to Max, whoever <laughs> Max's energy in the cafe was a real game changer for me. <laughs> That's beautiful. I, I really like that. Thank you for, for the answer, because I think that helps many people to, I mean, it's also, it's happening to everyone. It's not that anyone really gets younger, at least. I mean, I think it's also a lot of perspective because I think that, um, it, um, you, if, if you really put yourself on, on the position or in the perspective that you can grow younger inside of yourself. So uh, I think it's also a lot of mindset you can do there and uh, you always feel the way you feel from your age. And um, I think it's also, uh, uh, you can do a lot with your mindset about age. <laughs> I think. Absolutely. And, and I will say that, so there's, you know, maintaining a state of gratitude about what you have. And so yeah. what was interesting as I was going through these three years is, because I live and breathe in this space and do my very best to, to emulate it. I was, I would be aware of those things and I would put myself in a state of gratitude. Yes. I mean, think of how many people, you know, have much more struggles than I have either physically or uh, health wise or whatever. And even with all of that, I was still feeling these things at times. And I think maybe this is part of the human algorithm experience also, because what what's happening is I was watching and still am watching my parents get very old. And there's an awareness that 
you're the next generation. So, you know, you are the next one to be old. But I think the reason that we have this as part of the algorithm is because it's a wake up call. It it's it's like, you know, when you when you're a younger person and you're entering your 13, 14, 15 and you start to realize like, OK, you could like have a baby now, like you're you're entering the phase of life where you're potentially ready to do something else. And so physically and mentally, we get these cues that are hardwired into us that says you're transitioning to something. And I think what happens as I try and assess it and analyze it is as we are going through this period of late 40s, early 50s, we are transitioning and it is sending us a signal that says, listen, if you're not paying attention yet, this game is not going to go on forever for you. And so now is the time to really step back and reflect and be grateful for what you have and to map out the destinations and journeys and adventures that you want to go on because the clock is ticking and quite honestly, the clock is accelerating. And so I think maybe that's part of the way this works, that at these different phases, we get little wonderful taps on the shoulders and a little hug from behind that says, a little whisper in the ear that says, here's something to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I like that. I also think, I, I, I mean, I, it's not often that I think about it, but sometimes when, when I reflect on death and birth, um, I think both are such gifts, both somehow yeah. gift us life, <laughs> like the birth really in the sense of gifting us the moment, the first breath and, and starting to live. And the death also gives us gift of life by realizing how precious it is because it will come to an end. So both are sort of life givers uh, in a, in a, in a polar, is, is that an English word? I don't know, but it, <laughs> like on the opposite side. And um, so I think this is something where we don't have to, to be afraid of, but to, to just be grateful because we, 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 we get remembered on how amazing and beautiful it is to be here. Yeah. I think you're right. And I think in the time, earlier times in humanity, where you had multi-generations interacting so frequently together, yeah. whether it was your own family and your own grandparents, or whether it was just people in your community, that you had a hyper awareness, not in a bad way, but a hyper always present awareness of the aging process. Yeah. And now society has shifted to single families living together. You sort of lose that connection to what, what does it look like for one generation beyond your yes. own or two or three generations beyond your own. Yeah. Um, you talked about the algorithm that lies below everything and um, that is sort of like, I see it like this energy flow that is like within everything and you can tap into it. And um, I have made the experience that life the, or the quality of the life you live is very much dependent on the, on the quality of the questions you ask. Mm -hmm. So um What would you say are good questions you can ask when you tap into this algorithm? Or like, let's say, I mean, I think it was a cool uh, example where you see this. It's like Google. I mean, and depending on what you write into Google, you will get an answer. <laughs> so, um, and it, it's, you can also tap into the, the Google version, sort of. And uh, what would you say were good questions you ask yourself in your life? And what are good questions in general you can ask to, to tap into your own potential or into the pro positive perspective? Yeah, interesting. So I think the, in addition to the wording of the question, I think it's also the intention and the phrasing behind the question. So the emotion you attach to it. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. Uh, and the way in which the algorithm of the universe was at play as this was coming to be. And so I learned uh, probably maybe three, four, five years ago that one of the significant shifts for me was asking the question, why is this happening? but asking it in a different way. So when, when negative things would happen in my life, when I was younger, especially, I found it very hard to accept because I do my best to be a good person, to do good things for other people. And so despite that negative things would happen and I would find myself very frustrated and sometimes very angry and ask, why is this happening to me? Like it was very unfair and I didn't like it. And I thought it was completely unacceptable and especially unfair. And so I've learned to ask that question, but to ask it with a different tonality and a different intention. And so now when something is happening different than I expect it to, I do my very best to ask the question, huh, I wonder why this is happening. 
Wow, uh, I love this. And so let me give you an example of this in a way that it played out, because I don't think we've talked about this story, but this to me is one of the highlights of the way in which the algorithm is, is at our disposal. And so uh, I had written the third cafe book and it was done. And I had uh, sent it off to, to my editors around the world and it was done. But I had this idea for the book that there was going to be a letter from my godfather back to me in the book somewhere. And I could never quite find a place during the writing process to figure out where it was going to go. And so I didn't include it. And so I would sent it off to the editors. I hadn't looked at the file. I hadn't looked at the book. I hadn't looked at the project in four months. And I was in China on a trip and I was sick. It was, I had jet lag. I was sitting in there in, in this room that I didn't like. It was a, it was a family member's place and it was, I felt uncomfortable. And you're talking about how you feel when you're in Hawaii in that particular spot and how good it feels. This was the exact opposite of that. I felt out of place. I was uncomfortable. I was sick and I was laying in my bed. It was four in the morning with jet lag and I just felt frustrated, but because I've, like I said, I try and remember these connection points to the algorithm of the universe. And so in that moment, I thought to myself, why don't you ask the question in a good way? And so I, I laid in on this bed and I asked myself, huh, so why is this happening to me? Laura, in a second, like a second, what instantly flashed through my mind was this concept of this letter. And I laid in there and I, I sat in that space for a minute and it started to write itself in my head, this letter did. And so I grabbed the notebook and I started to write some things down. And the next day I woke up, finally went to bed. The next day I woke up and I had a train ride that I was going on. And on the train ride, I thought, I'm gonna try and write this letter. And so I write this letter and I get done with it. And my struggle had always been like, how do I integrate it into the story? And so I look at the story and it's like, all of a sudden I'm looking at a totally different, I'm, I'm either looking with different eyes or I'm looking at a different story because it's so obvious as I'm looking at it now, how this is going to integrate into the story. And so I integrate it all. I have actually high speed internet access while I'm on this train. I send an email to my editor and I say, Hey, I know this is going to sound crazy, but, and I sort of explain the whole story and here's the new file. And I said, I know that you're probably already printing books. She sends me back a message almost instantly that says, you're not going to believe this, but this morning I authorized us to start printing books, but I got your email. I told them stop right now. We're going to wait on this. The translator happens to be in my office today for something completely unrelated. She says she's got time. She'll work on it and we'll get this in the very first editions of the book. I mean, you couldn't write this in a movie script, right? This is just, Sometimes you are in a position where you're asked to be part of something so much bigger than yourself. And when I asked that question, I mean, I, I could have taken that night so many different ways based on where I've been at different places in my life. But thank goodness I had learned this cosmic algorithm of the universe question, which is, huh, wonder why this is happening. And when I asked that question, it opened up a whole unbelievable diorama of opportunities. And I will tell you in, in the year plus since that book has been released, the letter is the thing that people most come back to me and say, like, this just brought me to tears when I read that letter. So that to me is the opportunity that we have in life is to ask these types of questions. So that's an example of it. Mm -hmm. Another one um, in the very first cafe book, I, he discovers the John discovers the very first question, why am I here? And so depending on where you're at in your life story, if you're trying to figure out your genius and the way in which you're going to release your genius into the world, asking that question, why am I here? Not asking the question, do I have a purpose? Yes, you absolutely have a purpose. So ask the question, why am I here? What is my purpose? And just see what comes up from the cosmic algorithm of the universe. And at the start, if depending on your fluency, you may just get images or colors or symbols or something that you can't quite understand. That's okay. We all, one of my, another huge aha that I had in my life, and we may have talked about this before. Every genius, every expert starts off knowing nothing about what they became an expert in. Everybody who's ever won a Nobel Prize for contributing tremendously to the history of the planet started off one day. They didn't know anything about that topic. Nothing, zero, absolutely zilch. And so it doesn't matter if your current connection to the cosmic algorithm of the universe is just beginning because you can become fluent 
And so if you're getting these messages and it's in the form of a color or something else, that's okay. Grow your fluency, allow it to happen, and you'll get exactly where you want to go. I love this. Thank you for sharing. Um, one I, uh, one um, thing that, that I understood while you were talking is the difference, I think, in equality between the questions is when people usually ask, why did that happen? It's like a... Um, Ah, the German word is Vorwurf. Uh, um, what, what's the English word for it? So that, that you are, yeah, it's, it's you, you blame, you blame. Mm -hmm. So you're blaming, um, you blame life or something. So you go into the energy of being a victim of being, yeah, of, of giving the, um, the responsibility to some, something or someone else than yourself. And yeah. I love about the question, like, interesting like why why is this i'm wondering why is this happening the, the beautiful thing about this is you open up for guidance and i mm -hmm. think this is such a difference of course than in the quality of the answer because you 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 tap into a totally different stream of of information that can that you open up to and yeah. um I think that was so beautiful that I, I just understood it like inside of myself. That of course, you, the one thing is you ask for guidance and the other thing, thing is you ask for blaming someone <laughs> and that, that has a totally different energy. Yeah. And, and I don't want to minimize the situation that someone might be in in life. You know, you might, someone might be listening to this and they're dealing with a major illness or they're dealing with something hugely significant for their life. And I'm not saying that It's, I'm not saying those are fluff moments or easy to deal with moments or anything like that. I don't want to minimize it. What I'm saying is that perhaps if you're someone who's dealing with that, that when you come out of that and you've recovered, that you're going to either have a conversation that will change someone's life because you went through that experience or you might be the person who having gone through that experience ends up finding the cure for that. I don't know, but I know from my experiences on my own, in my own life and personally that operating from the place of blame just got me nowhere. And from the place of victim have got me nowhere. If I operate from the place of curiosity and connection, there's a chance I can turn whatever it is that's feeling very negative in my life into, so there's at least a chance that I can turn it into something positive. And I also think, I mean, I'm pretty sure you, you made the same experience, especially from the story you told me, there will always be an answer. Yeah. This, I think, is so interesting. It's never that there is silence. <laughs> Something will come. Yeah. And um, there was what you said. Maybe it's a symbol. Maybe it's a picture. Maybe it's a word. Maybe it's a sentence. Maybe it's a story or a letter. But something will come and to, to receive this then and be with it and to let it grow. I think this is also something really beautiful. What I love about this to just be open and receive then the answer that will come when you open up for guidance. Yeah. And, and I would say, don't doubt yourself in this regard. Like I'll tell you another very short, but uh, related story as it relates to the cosmic algorithm of the universe and trusting these questions when you ask them. So my mom had, um, a major heart issue. And so she was going to go in for heart surgery. And the process she was going to go through is they literally stop your heart and then they restart it. And they're only allowed to do this procedure three times. And so the issue was her heart was on an irregular heartbeat. And so she wasn't able to breathe 100% the way that everybody else on the planet breathes who's got a healthy heart. And so she went in for this procedure and they stopped her heart and they restarted the heart and it didn't work. The, the, the rhythm was the old rhythm. And so they did it again and it didn't work. And I was in the hospital and I was visiting her and they were going to let her go home and then come back and do it the third time. And I said, mom, how long have you had this? And she said, I think I've had this my whole life. She said, I remember as a little kid trying to climb a hill and be like, <gasps> and just could not catch her breath. And I had this sudden flash come to me, which was, And what came to me was actually a computer. It was the image of a computer, which made no sense in the context of the discussion I was having with my mom. Um, but I asked, and I sort of asked in that same way we're talking about of asking the cosmic algorithm of the universe. I think I asked the question, what does that mean? And I saw this, I suddenly had this awareness that if you take a computer that's got an issue and you load more software on top of it, the issue never goes away. You're just piling on more stuff on top of the problem. 
And when my mom had told me that I've had this my whole life, suddenly, Laura, I had this flash of insight that said, you were trying to ask your computer to reboot and show you something new, but nothing really has changed. And so I went to a professional musician and I said, can you do me a favor and record a healthy heartbeat? And they said, yeah, totally. So I, I had a healthy heartbeat recorded and I put it on an iPhone and I took it to my mom's house and I said, mom, every day for an hour, I want you to listen to this in your earphones, right? And I said, and the last thing I want you to listen to before you go into surgery the, the third time, for a half an hour, I want you to listen to this healthy heartbeat. And so she did this and they put her under, they turn off her heart, they restart it. And when they restarted it, Laura, which rhythm do you think it found? From the healthy heartbeat. Yeah. Right, the heart. Yeah. yeah. Now, I've never gone to medical school. I don't know anything about this, but it was my mom and I love her and I wanted to help her. And somehow, some way in that moment, the cosmic algorithm of the universe opened up the channel and said, oh, this is what you're looking for. Here you go. Even though I didn't have all the training, all of the sort of credentials to justify that. And I think that's what's available to all of us all the time. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank yeah. you. Um, I have so many more questions, but I will try to focus. I mean, we, we will have so many more conversations. But um, so uh, the one question I have, because you mentioned when you wrote the first um, Café am Rande der Welt, um, you said that you wrote it in 21 days and you sort of channeled it. So you, it just flew, like, how do you say, like it just went okay. through you and you typed it down. So um, can you maybe uh, take us back to the moment this started? What was that strain for, for you <laughs> to, to hear this? And uh, how did you react to it? And were you like, stop it? <laughs> Or did you go, okay, <laughs> let's, let's type it? How, how was that for you? So luckily I had just come back from a major endeavor, a major adventure in backpacking around the world for a year. And one of the things that I discovered through that experience, especially when I look back retroactively is when you, so I had wanted to travel the world since I was a little boy and I wanted to see Africa. I wanted to see the animals. I wanted to in meet interesting people and experience other cultures and doing that opened up this channel. It increased my fluency to continue to use the, the wording and the examples we've been using. So it increased my fluency a lot in terms of my connection to something much bigger than myself. And my intuition was at a very heightened point. And I had much more self-confidence because when you're out there traveling the world and you have to deal with things that before made you nervous and therefore you found workarounds to not deal with them, uh, but then you have to deal with them and you realize it's not as big of a deal and you grow your self-confidence that when something comes at you that you can't quite understand, you're able to approach it in a more like, well, I don't know, we'll give it a shot. We'll see what happens, right? And so when something inside of me said, sit down and type, I sat down and typed. I didn't judge it, I didn't evaluate it. I just sat down and typed. And the very first person ever to read the completed manuscript actually said to me, um, your book has changed my life. And so, This was incredibly validating and the whole story behind that is very bizarre and somewhat long, so I won't tell the whole story. But I think the other thing that happens is that as part of the cosmic algorithm of the universe, when you are moving in the direction that you want your life to go and you're fulfilling the purpose that you have identified for yourself, you will get moments of validation. And it's important in those moments of validation to allow yourself to say thank you, to not judge the moment, to not question whether you're good enough, to simply say thank you and embrace that and feel it and then continue to move in that direction. Thank you for sharing. There's one question um, that I started to ask in the podcast, every one of my guests, because one of my visions of my life visions is to really bring spirituality into the mainstream area so that it becomes the most normal thing people um, spend their time with, sort of. <laughs> So um, what, I, what I figured out is that for many people, they cannot really, um, they, they don't know what spirituality is or how they, like, yeah, it's, it's so un, unknown sort of for them. So right. what is spirituality for you? Like if, if, if you would have to describe it, what is spirituality to you and for you? I would say continuing to use again that sort of same verbiage that we've been using, I would say spirituality to me 
is this algorithm of the universe, the cosmic algorithm of the universe. It is everything that has ever been, is a, it is everything that potentially can be, not just for our individual lives, not just for this planet, but literally everything that is out there. And we have no issues typing on our phone a question on Google and getting an answer. And we don't even think about it. And yet, if, if you ask a thousand people, can you tell me exactly what's happening and why that works? I can pretty much get, including myself, by the way, I can pretty much guarantee that nobody really knows out of a thousand people. Now, I'm sure there are some people on the planet who can tell me exactly what's happening, but very few. And I believe spirituality is our willingness and opportunity to tap into this for the, and, and part of that is to, to allow ourselves to ask the question, why am I here? I mean, if you think about it, think of the randomness of that. You get 28,900 days statistically to be on the planet. So the question is, what are you going to do with it while you're here? And yet the vast majority of us go through our lives and nobody ever asks us that question. We're never taught to ask that question. We're never taught to tap into the algorithm of the universe information in the same way that we're taught to type on Google. Why? I don't know, maybe it's part of the journey. Maybe it's part of us having to discover that for ourselves. But to me, spirituality is the opportunity to live my life at the fullest possible potential to fulfill my purpose on the planet by allowing myself to tap into all of this. And by the way, the algor algorithm of the universe isn't just the underlying. So it's the underlying, but it's also you and I. You and I in a conversation can change each other's lives if we're willing to ask the interesting questions and hear what someone else's wisdom is bringing forth from them. So it's not just that we're dealing with the underlying, it's also the people around us, the environment, animals, everything. But to me, spirituality is all of that. And the question is, what is our place within that? And at least at the starter level, Laura, I think our place in that is to lend our genius to the collective. Now, if we do that, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen, but I couldn't tell you on the day that something inside of me said, sit down and type. I could have never told you on that day what I thought was going to be the, the results five years later. I could have never told you that that little thing would become a book and that little book would be in 42 languages and it would inspire people. I never could have described that. I never even could have envisioned that at that moment. But what I've learned is that if we allow ourselves to believe that we are here for a purpose, that we have genius to offer, and that there are tools at our disposal, like the cosmic algorithm of the universe, that that is spirituality. It's the chance to play amongst all of that in this beautiful playground that we have been given in this opportunity that we have. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And um, so you just um, released your new book here in Germany, at least. I don't know for how long it's already released in the States, yeah. but here it's released, I think, since two months, probably. Yeah, it came out uh, September 18th, I think, yeah. So um, it's called in German, Was ich gelernt habe, uh, what I've learned in, in English. And um, what, what if, if you... I mean, probably it's difficult to say, but what would for you be the the quint essence essence? I don't know, is that an English word? I just make it up. <laughs> um, from the book, like what what are the main things you would say you have learned until now? Yes. Yeah, so the the idea behind the book was when I when I read a story like the cafe books or the Big Five for Life it's an opportunity for me to share ideas and concepts through the context of a story. And I personally love stories. Uh, that's one of the, the ways that I learn best. There are times though, when something hits me, something powerful, like a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today so far, where it's not necessarily something I can see the way in which it ties into the story, or, or it's something that I feel I want to share even without, without needing to, to have a story framework that I just want to share it um, because sometimes what we have is just a minute or two in our lives and the ability to look at just three or four pages in a book and still get something very powerful. So that was the genesis of the idea. And the other genesis aspect of it was that I don't think that the world is desperately waiting to hear what John Strzelecki has learned. I do think that we all have things that we've learned. And part of what we've been talking about is tapping into that in order for us to tap into it, I think there's an opportunity for all of us to think about, wait, what have I learned and who would I like to share that with? 
And maybe it means you're having a conversation with your kid about something that's really interesting or enlightening that you've learned in your life. Maybe it's a best friend. Maybe it's a grandchild. Maybe it's a complete stranger in a random moment at a cafe. I don't know. But I think the the goal of this book is to inspire people to share some of what they've learned. And hopefully by reading through this, the examples that I give in the book, it will spur some very creative conversations and some very creative sharing uh, amongst everybody who reads it. That's really the goal. Nice. And um, at the end of the podcast, I have this one question. I mean, you answered it before, but I'm curious what your answers are going to be now. So I don't even know if you remember the question, but it is imagine it's the last day of your life. So you live many, 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 many beautiful more years. Uh, you have a beautiful life, write more books, and it will be the, the last day of your life. And I would come to you and I would say, John, there has been a technical problem everything is deleted, there is nothing left. Um, but I have a white uh, sheet of paper and a pen. And you can write on this paper three wisdoms, things you have learned in your life that you would like to pass on to, to the world, to other people, if nothing else you've ever said mm -hmm. would remain. So my first intuitive response to that is I would write that I would write to my daughter that I love you. Mm. So I get emotionally even thinking about that. Uh, because yes, uh, it would be very important to me to sort of try and leave something that would have a positive impact on as many people as possible. But honestly, the important person I'd want to know that is her. So that would be the first thing that I'd say. Um, as a matter of fact, I would probably use all three lines to write something just to her. So. And I, so let me think about what I would write to her. So the very first thing would be that I love you. Um, I'm so happy that I got to be your dad, right? And I think the third one would be you are special. Thank you for sharing. That's beautiful. That's, I, suppose, I suppose anybody who read it, they could apply it to their own lives. And uh, I would hope the message would carry the same, or at least some, some weight. Uh, that would be the person I'd write it to. Yeah. Thank you. So um, is there anything you would like to, to, to say to everyone listening? Is there something um, you want them to know? Um, so, of course, your new book... Um, is out there in the world now. I read it. It's beautiful. I love it. Uh, I mean, I love all your books. <laughs> I think they're so yeah. inspiring. And um, yeah, so in German, uh, the title of the book is Was ich gelernt habe. Um, and is there anything else that you would like to, to share right now? Is there anything in your heart that maybe I haven't asked yet <laughs> that you would like to say? So, well, so first of all, thank you. It's been a great conversation as always. It's such a, a treat to interact with you. And I, and I want to say for anybody who, I'm sure all of your fans who are listening already know this, but Laura has this amazing presence about her. Um, it, you can just get like an, a voicemail from Laura and you feel the peace and you feel the harmony and you feel the connection in something so simple. It's just a voicemail saying, hey, John, I just wanted to connect and say, how are you? Like you do an amazing job of being authentically you and in the process inspiring certainly me and I think probably everybody who listens to you that it's a wonderful thing to allow yourself to be you whatever that is you know your version of you is going to be different than me version of me my version of me which is going to be different from somebody else's version of themselves but one of the things that in the last months as we've been going through this unique situation in the world and people have had a lot of time to reflect I think it's an awesome time to allow yourself to ask the big questions. Why am I here? Who am I? Right. Am I playing in my playground? Uh, and, and to allow yourself to be the best version of yourself, the most authentic version of yourself. Uh, because in the same way that you, Laura, inspire countless people, whether it's just a moment of getting your voicemail and feeling that wonderful energy that you bring to everything that you do, or whether it's something bigger that someone will offer to the world in the form of a book or a movie or a conversation with their kid or whatever. Just allow yourself to be the best, most authentic version of yourself. And I think you'll log a lot of happy minutes in life. Thank you for sharing. And um, yeah, I always really also want to acknowledge you. I 
I'm always so, I was looking so much forward again to, to have this hour with you because every time, I don't know, but there's always such a special energy and there, I just love to be connected to you and to, to listen to you. I love how you tell the stories, how you see the world and how you, yeah, how you really opened up this portal for so many people to, to find this place, to get really good answers for your life. And, um, I'm looking forward to any conversations we are going to have in the future. And um, hopefully next time also when you're in Germany that we yeah, can create something together for the people so that we do like a John and Laura a book evening and you can read from your books and we can have a conversation. I mean, that was planned for this year. So I hope we can do it next year. And um, yeah, I just wish you from the bottom of my heart all, all the best for you, your family. And I'm excited to our next conversation <laughs> with your next book, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's before that. I, you know, I'll, I'll say one thing that uh, it's so since we can't be together on a stage and interacting with audience members and fans of, of the books and fans of your books and fans of your podcast, I would say one of the things that audience members can feel free to do is to push us a little. And so if you're listening to this podcast and something connected with you and you, you're thinking to yourself, that's interesting. And you know what else I've been wondering about is like, send it to Laura, send it to me. And that will push us to be thinking about things that we're not even thinking about yet, which again, I think is part of that whole goal. That's how we all collectively learn, how we all collectively grow. And so while I really don't think the situation will change enough that in the next six months, we're going to have a chance to sit on a stage together. So maybe six months from now, we'll do another podcast and we'll talk about these questions that people are pushing us to think about. And that'll be a next great version of the time we get to interact together. I love that. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.